We'll be covering the surgical steps involved in performing routine adult tricks. First structure you'll encounter is the skin and the incision. Once you go through the skin, you'll encounter subcutaneous fat. In obese neck patient, you have to core out a tract of subcutaneous fat to expose the trachea below. Next layer down is platysma. However, for most patients at midline, there will be no platysma present. As such, the next muscle layer down will be the strap muscles. Superficial to strap muscles, if you encounter vertically oriented vein, most likely it's going to be anterior jugular vein. This structure can be safely tied or clipped if it's in the way. Once you encounter the strap muscles, you want to divide the strap muscle vertically at a naturally existing dissection plane between the left and right strap muscles. Once you go past the strap muscles, you should palpate for the cricoid and it's important to stay inferior to the cricoid to avoid injury to laryngeal muscles. Depending on the patient and the size of the thyroid gland, you may see the thyroid gland sitting on top of the cricoid. Your goal is to divide the thyroid at midline to expose the cricoid and the trachea located deep to it. Once you reach the level of the trachea, you should then identify the second and third trachea ring which is commonly where the tracheal opening is made. Next, we'll discuss each of these steps in greater detail before proceeding with the surgical video. Orange lines mark the medial end of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Next, we'll palpate for the sternal notch and the cricoid. This helps you identify the second and third tracheal ring where you'll be aiming for for tracheal opening. For planned tracheostomy, we'll be making a horizontal incision located medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. For an emergent trach, you'll be using a vertical incision, which will help you identify different levels of trachea easier. Another thing to keep in mind is if you're performing a modified neck dissection, you want to make sure that the neck apron incision does not communicate with the tracheostomy incision. Exception to this rule is when you're performing total laryngectomy with bilateral neck dissection. In that case, the tracheostomy incision will be included as part of the apron incision for total laryngectomy. Once you cut through the skin incision, next layer down is the subcutaneous fat. As you go through the subcutaneous fat and before reaching the strap muscles, you may encounter vertically oriented blood vessel and most likely this is going to be anterior jugular vein which are located superficial to the strap muscles. In some patients, anterior jugular vein can be quite large, but they can be safely sacrificed without any complications. If you stay midline, most likely you will not encounter any platysma and instead encounter left and right strap muscles. Once you reach the strap muscles, your goal is to identify natural existing tissue plane called midline raffe, which is a bloodless tissue plane that you should be dissecting to reach the thyroid and trachea. Once you separate the strap muscles and approach deeper structures, it becomes critical to identify your midline and the cricoid cartilage. You can achieve this by first palpating for the thyroid cartilage, which is quite prominent in most patients. Follow it down inferiorly until you feel an indentation where the cricoid thyroid membrane exists. Cricoid thyroid membrane also marks the midline reference point. Immediately inferior to the indentation will be your cricoid cartilage. At the inferior margin of the cricoid cartilage, there'll be another step off where the first trachea starts. The reason why it's important to stay midline is to recognize that there are important structures that you want to avoid injuring located lateral to the trachea, namely carotid artery and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Carotid artery is located lateral to the trachea and you can generally palpate for its pulsation if you're not sure exactly where it's located. With that said, carotid artery is not typically seen during routine tracheostomy, and if you're seeing it within your surgical wound, it means you have drifted off way too far lateral. Contrastingly, recurrent laryngeal nerve might be within your surgical field if you drift off along the lateral border of the trachea into the tracheoesophageal groove. Thus, it's important to stay midline and along the anterior tracheal wall at all times. It's also important to limit your dissection inferior to the cricoid cartilage. Red arrow marks the thyroid cartilage, while the green arrow marks the cricoid. You can see the red bracket highlights the areas where the laryngeal muscles are attached, 
And by remaining inferior to the cricor ring, highlighted in green, you can avoid injuring the laryngeal muscles. Once you go through the strap muscles and dissect inferior to the cricoid, the next structure you'll encounter is the thyroid gland, depending on the size of the thyroid isthmus. The thyroid gland is quite vascular in nature, and if you inadvertently bovy the thyroid gland, it will have a sweet smell that is different from surrounding muscle. In certain cases, the distinct smell may help you identify the thyroid gland. There are multiple ways to divide the thyroid. The traditional way is to dissect bluntly behind the thyroid gland by remaining immediately superficial to the trachea, and once you are at the inferior margin of the thyroid isthmus, you can cross clamp the thyroid isthmus on both sides and then cut between the clamps to perform continuous running sutures to tie off the medial edge of the thyroid isthmus. Over the years, I have switched to simply cauterizing the thyroid isthmus with a bovi. As long as your FiO2 is at 20%, there's minimal risk of airway hazards. So my personal approach is use electrocautery to bovi through the thyroid isthmus until you reach the anterior wall of the trachea. Once you go fully through the thyroid gland, you will then identify your tracheal rings appearing as white cartilage structures. In some patients with short neck or cervical fusion, you may have to use a cricho hook to lift the cricoid and trachea superiorly for better exposure. From the inferior margin of the cricoid, identify your second and third tracheal ring, which will be where your trachea opening is commonly created. Avoid using the first tracheal ring for trachea opening as it will likely lead to problematic subglottic stenosis. Another key structure to avoid inferiorly is the anomic artery. Anomic artery is located near the sternal notch in most patients. However, in some patients with high riding anomic artery, it can be accidentally injured and cause massive bleeding when you're making a trachea opening. Next, we'll discuss different types of trachea opening you can use. There are three commonly used trachea openings. One option is to use a small window technique along the anterior tracheal ring. Another is to use a Bjork flap. And third is creating a linear incision between the second and third tracheal ring. My personal preference for most patients is to create a box-shaped small window opening along the anterior tracheal wall. It's important to keep this box located in the paramedian position. If you have a tracheal cross-section with the anterior wall, and the flat posterior wall, the small window will be located in the paramedian position before the trachea starts curving. It's important to not remove the curved portion of the trachea to preserve the anterior to posterior tracheal height. This will prevent undesirable tracheal malaysia that can occur after the cannulation. If you inadvertently create a trachea opening that's too large to include the curved portion of the trachea, now, it will lead to loss of the anterior posterior tracheal height. This can lead to undesirable trachea malaysia or trachea stenosis once patient is decannulated. Another commonly used approach, especially in obese neck patient, is to use a Bjork flap. When the cartilage is cut, the inferior ledge is left attached, and then the superior margin of the cartilage is sewn to the skin to create a stable opening that can be maintained if the trachea is ever dislodged. Additional benefit is to pull the trachea up superficially towards the skin, which can be a helpful feature in patients with very large neck. Based on my past experiences, one approach that I would not recommend is using a linear incision between the second and third trachea ring. Because a portion of the anterior trachea ring has not been partially removed, once the trachea opening is no longer stented, the trachea opening will collapse onto itself. So if the trach gets dislodged by accident, it will make placement back into airway that much more difficult. Once the tracheal opening design has been decided, the next step is to discuss the, your intent to enter the airway with the anesthesiologist. Here's a checklist of things that you should discuss with them. First, let them know you're about to enter the airway. Next, check with the anesthesiologist to bring the FiO2 down to room air to minimize the risk of airway fire. If the patient desaturates quickly, you can ask the anesthesiologist to create an oxygen reserve by giving high FiO2 temporarily to give them some reserve. Whenever you have high FiO2 in the system, you want to be mindful of using electrocautery 
as it can be a source of airway fire hazard. You also want to ask the anesthesiologist to loosen the endotracheal tube so that it can be easily manipulated and also ask for an endotracheal tube adapter so that it can be quickly connected to the circuit. Likewise, you want to check with your surgical tech and your surgical assistant to ensure that you have all the instruments you need for entering the airway. I like to lay out all the instruments in the sequence they'll be used. It's important to have properly sized tracheostomy tube in the room and also have one size smaller just in case the trach doesn't fit. For most adults, size 6 can be used, while tall individuals may require size 8. In patients with large obese neck, proximal XLT trach should be considered. In patients with tracheostenosis, you want to use distal XLT trach. Along with tracheostomy tube, you also should have a small endotracheal tube, such as size 5.5 or 6.0, in case the trach itself doesn't go in. Typically, and the tracheal tube is easier to slide in than a trach tube. So once you have the properly sized trach and a smaller trach and the tracheal tube, next thing is to make sure the trach tube cuff is working. Using a syringe, you can inflate the cuff and check for a pilot balloon to ensure that the cuff is not leaking. Once cuff is confirmed to be working fine, you want to deflate it and get it ready for placement. Other instruments you'll need is a cricoid hook, which can be used to lift the cricoid and trachea superiorly for better exposure. A 15 blade on a long handle can be used to make a trachea opening in a deep neck. A heavy curved male scissors can be used to cut through ossified tracheal cartilage. And lastly, tracheal spreader can be used to dilate the trachea opening before trach placement. Once you have all the checklists figured out, you're now ready to proceed with actually entering the airway. Use a cricoid hook and appropriately side retractors to gain adequate exposure to the trachea. Let the anesthesia team know that you're about to enter the airway. Here, you can see the endotracheal tube located within the trachea lumen. Once you confirm adequate hemostasis and you're about to enter the airway, you can start by deflating the endotracheal tube and advancing it distally towards the carina. This minimizes popping the endotracheal tube cuff while entering the airway. You want to go ahead and make a trachea opening by making it either a small window or a Bjork flap. It's common to see cartilage edges bleeding and you can use light electrocautery to control any bleeding while being aware of the risk of airway fire hazard, especially if your FiO2 is higher than room air. Next, you will want to pull the endotracheal tube back while visualizing the trachea tube through the trachea opening. The tip of the endotracheal tube should stop immediately past the superior margin of the trachea opening. Go ahead and suction any mucus or blood from the trachea. Next, using a trach dilator, dilate the trachea opening and remove it out of the way. And then place the tracheostomy tube using an obturator. Next, confirm with the anesthesiologist that you have return of CO2 and then remove all the instruments and the endotracheal tube. Go ahead and use sutures or Velcro ties to secure the tracheostomy tube. That concludes part A of the lecture that describes surgical steps. In part B of this lecture, we'll review a surgical video that demonstrates these surgical steps. Thank you for watching.